Dr. Silkin, thank you so much for meeting with us. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. And uh, you are a very prominent physician in the plant-based vegan movement. Can you tell us, please, a little bit about your background and what your focus is? Well, uh, I was actually uh, merrily going along my way as a, as a general surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic when uh, finally in the late 1970s and early 80s, I became increasingly disenchanted with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, uh, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. And <clears throat> in as much as I was uh, chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force, I felt an obligation to try to look around globally to see if uh, there are other culture, cultures or nations where the, the disease might be less frequent. And it was quite profound to see in Kenya that breast cancer was 30 to 40 times less frequent than the United States. And in rural Japan, in the 1950s, breast cancer was very in infrequently identified. And yet, as soon as the Japanese women <coughs> would migrate to the United States, still, by the second and third generation, still pure Japanese-American, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And <coughs> perhaps even more provocative was cancer of the prostate. In the in entire nation of Japan, in 1958, how many autopsy-proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? Eighteen in the entire nation. Now, <clears throat> by 1978, 20 years later, they are up to 137. But uh, that still pales in comparison with the 28,000 who will die this year in this country. Well, somewhere along the line there, I uh, felt that <clears throat> my bones would long be dust before I perhaps might get the answers between nutrition and cancer, although in hindsight I'm not <laughs> sure that's accurate. But nevertheless, it seemed to me that there would be more bang for the buck if we looked at the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, which is cardiovascular disease. Because in this review, there were multiple cult cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. And uh, the Okinawans, uh, Papua Highlanders, rural Chinese, Central Africa, the Tarahumara in northern Mexico, the common denominator, whole food, plant-based nutrition without oil. and. Uh, so shortly thereafter, I pulled my act together and, and uh, began a small study. It had to be small because I still had all my surgical obligations. But it was uh, these 24 patients who were ser seriously ill with cardiovascular disease to see if we couldn't get them to eat whole food plant-based nutrition. And that's how it started. And um, we met with Dr. Kim Williams last month the president, the current president of the American College of Cardiology. And he mentioned that the diet that you recommend, as well as the diet that Dr. Ornish recommends, have been seen to actually reverse plague and atherosclerosis. Can you tell us, so what, uh, what does this diet entail, the diet that you recommend? If somebody tells you what is the diet that, that would provide most optimum health, what is the diet that you would recommend? Well, the diet <coughs> that we have uh, been tr that I've been trying to recommend, although it's lower in fat considerably than the typical Western diet, it's not meant to be a no-fat diet, maybe no added fat, uh, but we want our patients to eat whole food, plant-based nutrition, food as close to grown as possible. And in my case, I specifically uh, want them to eliminate the foods that are going to injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels, which all experts agree is where we have the inception of cardiovascular disease. We don't want foods that are going to injure that endothelium because the endothelium is making an absolutely magic molecule that <clears throat> does wonderful things for protecting our blood vessels. It keeps all the cellular elements in the bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest vessel dilator in the body. 
And if you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate. That's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, stiff, or inflamed. Protects us from high blood pressure or hypertension. Number four, most importantly, nitric oxide in a normal healthy amount will protect us from ever developing blockages or plaque. And number five, <clears throat> nitric oxide will inhibit <clears throat> the migration of smooth muscle in the artery wall from, from migrating into the plaque. And number six, nitric oxide can destroy the foam cell, which is what erodes the cap over the plaque, allowing the cap to rupture. That's it's extremely important. Absolutely key. Nitric oxide. So if we can get patients to change their internal biochemistry, not without a single pill or procedure or an operation, <clears throat> just through nutri nutrition alone, they can sufficiently change their biochemistry. So this cascade of events of where cholesterol migrates into the subendothelial space, becomes oxidized, <clears throat> then with all these reactive oxygen species, we have the formation of ultimately the foam cell, and then the foam cell is capable of eroding the cap over the plaque. And with plaque rupture, <clears throat> now we have uh, induction of thrombogenesis to the rupture and creation of a clot and a heart attack. All that entire cascade can entirely be interrupted with whole food plant-based nutrition. That's amazing. It is the strongest tool in medicine's toolbox mm -hmm. because here it can literally vanquish, annihilate, if you will, 75 to 80 percent of the common chronic killing disease. It's not just cardiovascular disease. Strokes, hypertension, diabetes, GERD, asthma, MS, lupus, rheumatoid, osteoporosis, diverticulitis. I mean, the list goes on. It's quite exciting. And I think <clears throat> this is where we have the potential for a truly seismic revolution in health, which is never going to come from a pill, an operation, or procedure. Mm -hmm. when, we, uh, <clears throat> when we in the medical profession have the will, the grit, and the determination to share with the public, what truly is the lifestyle and especially the nutritional literacy well, it empowers them to be the locus of control to eliminate these diseases. Definitely. And you have mm -hmm. done a lot of uh, research on your own. Um, I remember some images that I've seen. In particular, you had a patient who I believe was a physician. Mm -hmm. So you have seen actual concrete changes in the vasculature mm -hmm. uh, through arteriographies and mm -hmm. nuclear scans. Yeah. And this is all mostly on a plant-based whole foods diet? Correct. If uh -huh. they come to me already on medications, and, what, and most of them that I see already have a primary care physician and a cardiologist, uh, I don't change their medications because that would just be chaos. Because with patients coming from Singapore, from Indonesia, from <clears throat> New Zealand, Australia, Canada, throughout the United States, the United Kingdom and Belgium. I mean, uh, it's so nice to reassure those patients that their physicians, as their cholesterol begins to come down, they'll reduce their cholesterol-lowering medication. As their blood sugar comes down, they'll reduce their diabetic medication. Uh, and as their hypertension comes under control, they'll reduce their, diabetic, uh, their uh, hypertensive medication. And that's as it should be. They're there with those physicians who are going to be by their side, but who don't necessarily have, necess maybe don't have the skill set, expertise, or interest. But so far, over the last 30 years, we have yet to have a physician call me and say, Dr. Esselstyn, how dare you teach my patient the healthiest diet on the planet? <laughs> of course not. And uh, currently, the 
cholesterol level that we're supposed to have is set to under 200 milligrams total cholesterol. Do you feel like patients and physicians should be comfortable with that kind of cholesterol levels? Or do you feel like we still progress, have the potential of progressing towards heart disease with those cholesterol levels? I don't think anybody would say that heart disease is caused by a number. Heart disease is caused by what is passing through your lips every day. It is going to disrupt and injure this marvelous endothelial fortress that protects our artery. Once you try to injure the fortress, cholesterol is going to get through there and be a problem. Now, the, where we are today, when people get so totally tied into numbers, you can be eating an absolutely horrible diet and be taking a gorilla dose of statin and have a marvelous number and then sit there being very puzzled and scratching your head while you ever had a heart attack when you had an LDL of 70 or 60. But what do you got? You've, when an autopsy, those people are just filled with plaque. So that, you know, that's really a very, very false sense of security. So anybody, once they've had a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, I want them to understand the disease well enough so that they will agree with me that we want to stop totally the causation of this illness, which is any morsel of food that passes their lips that will again further injure an already injured endothelium. Completely agree, completely agree. And um, right now what we're doing I know that you've mentioned that we're doing kind of a palliative care with regards mm -hmm. to the way that we approach our right. number one killer, That's right. cardiovascular disease. Uh, can you expand a little bit on that? Well, <clears throat> the reason that I have referred to present cardiovascular care, and by the way, I have nothing but the greatest admiration and respect for my cardiovascular colleagues, their care, their compassion, and their fund of knowledge, but uh, presently, uh, it to me is totally unacceptable to treat patients with drugs, procedures, and an operation which have absolutely nothing to do with the causation of the illness, uh, that literally it's, it's a guarantee that these patients are going to have to have their second stent, third stent, fourth stent, fifth stent, maybe throw in a bypass, then more stents to keep the bypass open. And these procedures and these drugs and all this imaging are not only do they have significant morbidity and mortality, but they are prodigiously expensive. 45% of Medicare is cardiology. And what is cardiology? It's the first stent, second stent, third stent, fourth stent, bypass, more stents, congestive heart failure, and you die. Die of what? a completely benign foodborne illness that never had its causation treated. So I think we can do better. Yeah. And part of the problem with that, <clears throat> I guess, is because there's a lot of literature that says that if you have a lesion somewhere in your heart, you probably have lesions in the other vessels that supply the heart and the other vessels in our body, right? So even if we are just doing a bypass to a very specific place, uh, the chances are that we're going to have complications uh, <laughs> from the disease. Yeah, you're elsewhere. talking about we play whack-a-mole, and, and it's just, uh, no, it's, it doesn't succeed. This is why the, the present cardiovascular approach cannot cure patients. The present cardiovascular approach will never end the epidemic, and it is unsustainably expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dr. Sustin, the same physician that I mentioned about the triple disease, Dr. William C. Roberts, he wrote a paper that said that humans had more so the characteristics of herbivores, even though we behave as omnivores and eat flesh and vegetables. He said, well, humans with their intestines, the length, their um, appendages, their teeth, actually have the characteristics of herbivores. I wanted to get your reaction on no, that. I, what do you I, think? I've heard Bill Roberts explain that, and I uh, totally happen to agree. And uh, I think the, 
the excitement that I have today is always that there, there really is a, an increasing awareness among thoughtful cardiologists that what they're doing is, is not a winner. And I don't think that could be better uh, personified than with the leadership of Kim Williams, who's the newly elected president of the American College of Cardiology, who himself thrives on plant-based nutrition and asks that his patients do as well. Excellent. And one last question, Dr. Sussin. Is there cholesterol in anything else other than animal foods? I mean, we make cholesterol for all of our needs, and we do not need to consume it from outside sources, no, right? No, no. And is there cholesterol in anything else other than animal foods and animal products? Uh, not unless somebody's in ingesting it artificially. No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay, it's more so just mammalian animal products that yeah. contain it. Okay. Oh, well, that's Dr. Esselstyn. I know that uh, um, President Bill Clinton speaks highly of you and how uh, he called you a militant doctor. <laughs> But he said that, uh, you know, you change his life and his health improves so much. Can you just tell us a little bit about uh, that experience? My only experience him? is I know that he was kind enough to give us a, uh, uh, a very supportive comment about uh, my book. And yes, I confess that although I'm uh, known as a bit of a taskmaster, uh, I'm hopefully not as mean as I look. <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Agresa. Sure. We very much appreciate yeah. your time.